Okay, we are now live. So we're just going to wait for a few attendees to trickle in. It does take a few minutes before we begin. Okay, I'm going to give it just a little bit more. Okay, and I think this is everyone. So let's begin. Okay, everyone. Hi, my name is Laura Gramis. I am the public information officer for Lehigh County. Apologies that I do not have a video with me today. You guys have to listen to my voice. Um, but I would like to thank you for joining us for um, this week's 2021 Citizens Academy. This week, we are with the Chief Public Defender, Kimberly McCool. Um, so a little bit about myself is I am the public information officer for Lehigh County. I have, I host these, um, presentations weekly. So if you tune in last week, you may be familiar with how this format's going to go or in the future, how these will work. Um, before we begin, I would like to do a little disclaimer just so we know how tonight's program is going to work. Um, today's presentation will focus on the history and role of the public defender in Lehigh County. We ask that you refrain from all questions and comments until after a panelist is finished presenting. Any off-topic comments or questions will be withheld and we'll have to move on to the next attendee. If you would like to comment on a topic or ask a question, please use the raise your hand option to be recognized. If you're joining us today um, on a computer or phone app, you will need to click on the raise your hand feature. If you're joining us today by telephone, you will need to enter star nine on your phone to be asked to speak. Then the moderator will unmute you and let you know it is time for you to ask your question. After you've asked your question and it has been answered, the ability to speak will then be withdrawn. So other than that, I will pass it over um, to Kim. Kim, take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you everybody for um, coming. Um, I wanted to just first tell you a little bit about myself and then um, I, um, I have a PowerPoint presentation, so we will go through that. Um, and then, of course, as Laura said, when it's all over, um, you know, feel free to ask me questions regarding the presentation. So my name is Attorney Kimberly McCool. Um, I am the Chief Public Defender for Lehigh County. I was um, appointed to that position by the um, then County Executive Tom Muller in 2014. Um, I was appointed as the first full-time chief that Lehigh County had. So this is my full-time job. Um, I began my career, um, if I tell you the year, you're gonna know how old I am, but uh, I, I began my career uh, many years ago in the public defender's office. Um, and I worked there for many years. I uh, was full-time and then I went to part-time status. Um, I then left to, um, I was had many children and so um, I needed to concentrate on that a little bit. Um, but I always, even when I um, was not in the public defender's office, um, I worked in a private practice, but I always accepted court appointments representing people um, that needed representation and um, the court would appoint me to represent them. I did that for many years and then I was eventually became a conflict attorney, which is the same as a public defender, but it is an attorney that is paid by the county to represent individuals when there's a conflict with the public defender's office. So um, if several people are charged for a crime, uh, the public defender's office can't represent all of them, especially if one person is going to be a witness against the other. And so I would represent them as a conflict attorney. So it's basically the same as the public defender, but conflict attorneys represent people um, not as part of the public defender's office, but out of their own um, individual uh, offices. And then, as I said, in 2014, I became the chief public defender. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, and now if we can start the uh, presentation, I'll begin explaining about the public defender generally, and then about the Lehigh County Public Defender. Okay, so that's just the, <laughs> the title, um, the Lehigh County Office of the Public Defender. Okay, so the history of the public defender. 
Um, many people have probably heard of the case Gideon versus Wainwright, which was decided in 1963. Um, a lot of people have heard of that case in history classes, in, in civics classes, um, maybe even uh, you're watching the news and, and somehow this, this case might come up in a particular context, but um, Clarence Earl Gideon was charged in a Florida state court with having broken and entered a pool room with the intent to commit a misdemeanor. And it was a non-capital case under Florida law, uh, which means it, it obviously was not a homicide case. It, it was not, there was no death penalty involved and it wasn't even a felony case. It was a misdemeanor um, under Florida law. The defendant appeared in court. He said he had no, no money and he didn't have a lawyer. And he said to the judge, judge, I need a lawyer. I need a lawyer to represent me properly. And I don't know, I can't represent myself. I don't really understand um, the laws. And so I need an attorney. And <clears throat> the request was denied because Florida, uh, the law of Florida only permitted a lawyer to be appointed for indigent defendants, people who can't afford to pay for an attorney, only in capital cases. That was what their, their state law said. So he had to conduct his own defense. He was convicted and he was sentenced to prison. Subsequently, he appealed and, and he, the, the terminology is he applied for a writ of habeas corpus, which means he asked the court to release him. That's what an application for writ of habeas corpus means, but it's basically an appeal. And he said, I wanted to appeal on the grounds that the trial court's order to um, not appoint me a lawyer denied my constitutional rights. That, this is what Mr. Gideon said to the court. My rights were violated when the court refused to appoint me an attorney. The state Supreme Court, not the US Supreme Court, the state Supreme Court denied all of the relief and said, no, you know, no, that's, that's, not, um, that's not what our law says. There is no right to have an attorney in a non-capital case. So the case went up to the state Supreme Court. Now I will tell you what, what happened was um, in the states, in what, I mean, in the, the, the um, the case went to the U.S. Supreme Court. I apologize. Uh, the, the case went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And when it got there, the U.S. Supreme Court appointed um, Mr. Gideon an attorney. And um, this appeal then went before the full United States Supreme Court. Justice Black wrote a unanimous opinion of the court, meaning all of the judges, all nine justices agreed with this opinion and said that reason and reflection require us to recognize that in our adversary system of criminal justice, any person called into court who is too poor to hire a lawyer cannot be assured a fair trial unless counsel is provided for him. Um, he further stated, and I'm not gonna just read this whole PowerPoint to you, so don't worry, but these, these quotes I think are important. Um, he further stated, our state and national constitution and laws have laid great emphasis on procedural and substantive safeguards designed to assure fair trials before impartial tribunals in which every defendant stands equal before the law. This noble idea cannot be realized if the poor man charged with a crime has to face his accusers without a lawyer to assist him. So I, I showed you a, um, the, the picture of the, the gentleman reading the book that is Mr. Gideon um, trying to do research and, and trying to defend himself. Um, and on the, the other picture is uh, Justice Black. And so I just gave, wanted to give you a little bit of um, little pictures to kind of fill in the story. But that's the story of, of Mr. Gideon. And so this is the first time, 1963, by the way, that the United States Supreme Court held that in all state prosecutions where, and, and, and this is something that 
um, sometimes is misunderstood as well. But in state prosecutions, where there is the potential loss of liberty, um, you have the right to have a court appointed attorney if you cannot afford an attorney. So that means that the, the state or the government must pay for that attorney. Okay, next, next slide, please. Now, in Lehigh County, and another thing I want to just say about that is, so that happened in 1963. Now, remember, you know, our Constitution, you know, was was written in the late 1700s. So that's a really long time that um, that this issue went unresolved, right? From the time of the constitutional amendments um, being ratified until 196, the 1960s. I will also say that um, the court ruled that a person was entitled to a public defender or to a, a, an attorney, a court appointed attorney, um, under the Sixth Amendment of the United States Constitution. So uh, that's a very important um, amendment. And um, when, we, when you talk about a person receiving court appointed counsel, that's the amendment that you always look to is this, the Sixth Amendment right to counsel. But how did that translate? What did we do here in Lehigh County? Well, in response to this ruling, so now it's the 60s, right? There's, there's, there's court going on. Um, and um, the, in response to this, the Lehigh County Bar Association, working with the courts, formed what they called a group of voluntary defenders. Now, voluntary defenders were a group of the newest lawyers of the bar. Usually they were recent law school graduates who were required to be in criminal court to receive court appointments to represent individuals who needed counsel but didn't have the money to hire a private lawyer. Um, the attorneys were not paid for their services. It was sort of a rite of passage. So I will tell you um, another little, uh, you know, some personal information about me. My, my father uh, was an attorney. My father uh, began his career in the district attorney's office and then became a criminal defense lawyer. But before he joined the district attorney's office, when he was fresh out of law school, this is one of the things he had to do. He had to go into court um, and uh, he had to, he and other members of the bar and they would sit there and a person would come up and the judge would say to this defendant, a person who was charged with a crime, uh, Mr. So-and-so, what do you intend to do with your case? And the person would say, well, I don't know. I don't have a lawyer. Um, and they would say, okay. Um, and they would pick a lawyer out who was sitting there. Um, this, meet your lawyer, go talk to him. And um, now many times the lawyers, as I said, were appointed the day of trial and had, did not have enough time to prepare. Um, and, and, you know, I've talked with, I've actually researched this issue and talked to um, attorneys who practice when that system was in effect, um, attorneys who've been practicing a lot longer than I have, and they talked about certain situations where they did in fact have to, they met somebody and in the afternoon they were picking a jury to, to proceed with a jury trial. Obviously, that's not uh, an adequate system. So, you know, you're providing an attorney, but what kind of a job can an attorney do for a person, right, in that situation? There's no time to prepare. There's no time to call witnesses. Sometimes there would be. Sometimes they would get the case and they would be able to get it continued, especially if it was a more serious case. But, but quickly, everybody learned that that really wasn't the best situation. So the county decided to form the Public Defender's Office who had the responsibility of representing all indigent people charged with offenses in Lehigh County. Okay, and, I'm, and, and I have a little, a little thing there. This is actually, um, a little, the picture is a comic strip, but at, they're not, not a strip, actually a comic book. Um, they produced these, I believe, I don't know if they were in the 60s or the late 50s. Um, I always forget and I always look it up and then I forget again, but uh, the, I, have, I have blown up pictures of the covers of some of these comics in my office. I love them. Uh, and it's the public defender in action. So um, so there is, so you can find them if you ever are interested, you can go on eBay. Um, but that's what that, that's what that picture is, is from. Uh, okay, next slide, please.
Okay. Um, all right. So <clears throat> the public defender um, endeavors to protect the rights of our clients by providing holistic, vigorous, compassionate, and ethical legal representation to individuals who cannot afford, afford to pay for an attorney. Um, our attorneys, uh, people ask this question all the time. Um, our attorneys are attorneys. Um, we are highly trained, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, but we all have gone to law school. We all have passed the bar exam, just like any other attorney um, practicing in any other area of law in Pennsylvania. Sometimes people will say things like, um, yeah, I don't want the public defender. I want a lawyer. Well, the public, the public defender, we are lawyers. So, um, and when I say that uh, we are highly trained, um, one of the things that I pride myself on in our office is seeking out all kinds of training opportunities for our attorneys um, so that our attorneys are trained uh, not just in trial skills, which they also go to um, for the newer attorneys, they attend newer attorney trainings and um, they go to, we, we call it a new, new attorney uh, training boot camp that they go to. Um, but not only are there, and then there are other trial skills that they learn as they get, as they advance in their career, but we also um, have them participate in all kinds of opportunities to learn things about evidence and collection of evidence and um, expert witnesses and social services and things like that. We try to make our attorneys have a wide variety of training opportunities so that they can understand a lot of the complex issues that our clients um, encounter before and during, you know, when they are in the um, criminal justice system. In addition to our attorneys, we have investigators um, and we also have client advocates that, that are akin to social workers, but we call them client advocates. Um, and that is something that, that we are very proud of in our office, that we have our own investigators who can investigate situations. They can go out and talk to witnesses. They can take photographs of, of crime scenes. Um, they can uh, look and review the evidence that we've given. So they're, part, or, or, you know, that we are given by the district attorney um, so that they can be part of the defense team and they are part of, of helping us and assisting us determine the evidentiary value of certain items and interpret some of that evidence. And our client advocates are just, I have to say, are just amazing. Um, we had one, we now have two. Um, they help uh, with our clients in a, in a whole um, uh, just wide variety of areas. They will assist with housing. Um, they will assist with um, drug and alcohol, uh, mental health, and they will um, assist people, helping people get their um, public assistance if there if there is an issue with that. They are and they are also part of our team. They can help collect evidence for mitigation purposes, meaning that if we are going before a judge and we want to explain to the judge the reasons behind this person's um, actions, they will help us. They will help us not only to understand it, but they will help you know, collect that information for us. And they work very well with the clients and they're there with our clients um, from the beginning. And this is something new. Our office just, uh, we had the first we hired our first client advocate last year in January, and then unfortunately COVID happened and then there was a lot of working remotely um, and it was a little bit more difficult to interact with clients. But even though a lot of, of what we do is still remote and still um, video conferences and telephone conferences, they're still very, very much involved. Um, they have been really integral in uh, helping us to get people released from jail um, and helping them find um, housing situations, um, which enables them to get paroled or to get bail. 
um, and other things and you know getting into certain programming. So um, we're very happy with that program and um, we're very proud of that program that we have. Um, we represent um, individuals and when we say eligible individuals, um, I'll explain that a, a, for a moment. Um, we do have a um, eligibility criteria in terms of uh, finances. So um, our responsibility, there is a Public Defenders Act of Pennsylvania. And so what we are tasked with, our responsibility um, is to represent individuals who cannot afford to pay for an attorney. And so we have um, an application which clients will fill out and I'll talk about that a little bit more as we get into this, but I will review them and we ask for certain financial information and then we determine whether a person is indigent. And if they are indigent, um, they are now eligible for, for representation through the public defender's office. So we will represent them, all eligible individuals in, in all misdemeanors and felonies. Um, we do not represent people if they have what's called an ARD eligible DUI. So if it's a first offense driving under the influence charge, if it's a first offense and they're eligible for the, a county program called Accelerated Rehabilitative Disposition, um, which is a special probation, if the client completes it, the charges get dismissed, the record gets expunged. We won't represent individuals in that proceeding, um, but if for some reason they're not eligible for ARD, um, if it's a second or subsequent offense, or if it's a first offense, offense and they're not eligible for whatever reason, we will represent them as long as they are financially eligible. We will also represent all juveniles in delinquency matters, um, as well as individuals charged with driving with a suspended license, DUI related, because there is mandatory jail time there. Um, involuntary mental health commitments, we represent people in, and any other matter where representation is constitutionally required. Um, I say that because there are certain situations that, for example, um, somebody um, owed fines and costs to the county for a previous charge um, and they're held in contempt because they haven't paid that. One of the, one of the uh, punishments, quite frankly, or, or one of the outcomes could be jail. And so we will represent people in that situation. Whenever a person's liberty is at stake, um, the public defender will represent that individual. There are things that we don't represent people on where, um, where there is a chance of jail time, but there are uh, other groups of attorneys that are provided to those people free of charge as well. So in other words, it's, it's basically, it's the same thing as having a public defender, it's just not through the public defender's office. So we ensure that um, individuals, who, in whether it's a domestic relations, you know, if it's a, dom a domestic relations issue, they will have court appointed attorneys to represent those individuals. So we make sure, we as a county make sure that people are represented if ever there is a risk of loss of liberty. Um, okay, next, next slide, please. Okay. Um, holistic defense model. So this is something that is kind of cutting edge and um, I'm very um, excited about it. I've been studying the holistic representation model since um, I became the chief back in 2014. Um, so um, holistic defense, and this is a quote from the Rand Corporation um, on a study that they did regarding ho the holistic model of defense. So I'll, I'll kind of read a little bit of this quote and then I'll get into a little bit more of an explanation. The um, holistic defense model is based on the idea that to be truly effective advocates for their clients, defenders must adopt a broader understanding of the scope of their work. To this end, defenders must address not only the immediate case at hand, but also the enmeshed or collateral legal consequences of criminal justice involvement, such as loss of empl employment, housing, custody, immigration, and the underlying life circumstances and non-legal issues 
that so often play a role in driving clients into the criminal justice system, such as drug addiction, mental illness, family, or housing instability. Um, as I said, the Lehigh County has two client advocates, which are social workers, which are part of that holistic model, as, as well as two investigators, also part of the holistic models. Um, we have also expanded the areas of representation to ensure that individuals have representation as early as possible in the process. So we um, began representing people at proceedings that previously um, they were not represented at. Um, and so I, I really believe that we need to be involved as soon as possible. Um, one of the things that um, I think is really important is to not only have the lawyer involved right away, but is to have the client advocate involved right away. Um, and we are working right now on um, something which would basically have a client advocate daily in the jail, rather than going to the jail to speak to clients to respond to an attorney's request that, well, you know, we'd like you to, you know, interview these five clients. What our idea is to have the um, client advocates in there from the beginning and being one of the first contacts that the clients see. So we think that's a really wonderful way um, to make sure that this whole holistic defense model works. The idea of it, and that's what that little illustration is, is that the client who's, who's in red is the center. And all these other um, entities, the lawyer, the investigators, the client advocates, um, will aid that defendant. Rather than the defendant going out, the client going, you know, and, and getting, going out and having to see this um, particular um, individual for assistance with uh, maybe housing and this individual for, um, you know, assistance in, in maybe, um, you know, immigration issues. We try to bring it all to the client. Now, we do not at this time, um, we do not have, we are, our defenders are all defenders. We are all uh, criminal defense lawyers. However, um, to that end, we actually do have attorneys who have gotten special training um, in immigration issues so that we can provide that um, to our clients. But certainly if our clients do have immigration issues, I mean, we always recommend that they speak to an immigration attorney, but we have relationships with immigration attorneys that we will also speak to as well to get information um, for our clients. So, but but again, that that is not. Um, there are some offices that um, do have, um, as part of this model, they have other attorneys who aren't criminal attorneys. Um, but we have just begun this process of of creating this model. This is a newer model. This is not a model that every defender's office has in the country. I mean, far, very, very far from it. Um, as I said, it is a much more progressive and uh, newer model in defense, but. It has been proven, this model, when you read these studies, it has been proven to, um, there is a, a uh, public defender, the Bronx County Public Defenders has uses a holistic model. The um, Knox County, Tennessee, uh, their public defender's office uses a holistic model. And what they have found is they have saved um, taxpayer money it has reduced recidivism, meaning repeating crime, and um, it has it has also re reduced jail time. So it is better for everybody. It is better for everybody, for society. Um, we don't see the recidivism. The recidivism goes down. Um, it is better for the individual. They spend less time in jail. They're more likely not to reoffend, and as well as the taxpayer, because it costs a lot less money. Okay, next next slide. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, how do, how does a person get a public defender? So there's a lot of ways, and I have um, in red online application coming soon, which is another thing I'm very excited about. So we <clears throat> right now we have a fillable application um, on our website. If you go to the website, you can fill out a fillable form and you can hit submit 
although I will tell you it works better on certain browsers than others. Um, and you do have to upload certain financial things, financial documents. Um, and um, so some people have difficulty with it. It's not, uh, it's, it's better, you know, if you can't come in, it's better than, than having to drive in um, that you can do it. You could also print it out off the website and fill it out. Um, you can come into the office and get an application on the sixth floor. Although now with COVID, we're encouraging people to either print it out from the website, fill in, type in the fillable form and submit it. Um, we also have them um, at the um, magisterial district justices offices. And, and I thought I had put this in here, but um, maybe I did not. We also in the lobby of the courthouse have a display that have all kinds of forms from our office. And one of them is the application for, the, for a public defender. Um, to get it back, I will tell you, my goal is to be able to provide representation to individuals. That is my goal. So I am not going to make it difficult and say, you must come in and you must hand us an application. No, we, you can email it. You can fax it. You can submit it online in the way that I just told you about, or you can drop it off. We have a drop box in the lobby of the courthouse. So we try to do things um, as easily as possible. In fact, we also have individuals sometimes who they, they can't scan it and email it because they don't have a scanner um, and they can't get down to our office. So they take pictures of each page and they email us the pictures of the application and the pictures, you know, they take it with their phone of their financial items and we accept it that way. Um, we are absolutely willing to work with, with um, everybody to try to ensure that people who qualify get representation. Um, if a person's incarcerated, they don't have to go through the application process. They make a request through the intake process. In other words, when they're first um, admitted to the jail, they make a request through that process or through their case manager and it gets electronically sent to me through our case management system. So every day, twice a day, I get um, requests uh, via our electronic system and I am able to approve them. Usually it says we will, you'll be notified in five to seven days regarding your approval status. I mean, that's like if we have to mail you a letter and that's how you find out. Generally approvals are done within a 24 hour period of time. Um, absent some other circumstance. And generally you're assigned, and if you are approved, you're assigned an attorney within probably 48 hours. So what we always tell everybody is, if you've applied for a public defender, um, give us a couple of days and give us a call back and any staff member can look up your name and see who your attorney is. And if you haven't been assigned an attorney yet, they can tell you where you are in the process. Our, our software is, is wonderful. It will tell, it will tell the staff member, you know, whether your application has been approved, if it's approved and now we're just waiting for an attorney to be assigned and where exactly it is in the process. Um, okay, uh, next slide, please. So I apologize, you're gonna hear a <laughs> talk in the background. So I apologize for that. Um, okay, so um, so Laura, I, I'm gonna just ask a, a question of you. Is it, you. Uh, is it uh, oftentimes I will, oftentimes I will um, at, when I did this before in person, I would stop at this point and ask if there were questions because I'm sort of shifting gears a little bit. Would you rather have me wait for the end? Because there's only two more slides, or do you want me to? Ask, can I stop now and ask the question? Uh, it's up to you. Um, we can take a pause if to catch up on any questions in the meantime, so it's still fresh in people's minds. Okay. We do have two questions lined up already. If you'd like to address those before moving forward. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Alrighty. Um, if you want, I can read them out to you. Um, oh, okay. All right, go, go ahead. Sure. Okay. It, and if you have access to read them on your end too, then maybe you can in case I um, word it wrong. But the first one is from Robert Walden. And he would like to know, 
How long does an attorney meet with a client before a preliminary hearing? And how long does an attorney meet with a client before, oh, it looks like the question just duplicated itself. Before a preliminary arraignment, okay. All right. Oh, arraignment, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. So that all depends on the case. Um, that there is no answer. Nobody can answer that question definitively. It depends on the case. It depends on the circumstance. So in other words, um, it depends on how much information, how much information needs to um, be provided, needs to be exchanged in order for the attorney to have a, a full understanding of um, the case. Um, so it, that is really a case by case, um, you know, it's, it's on a case by case basis. Um, and, um, you know, there may be a situation where an attorney um, has been representing a client on other charges and knows that these other charges are coming down. So they might have met with them three, four, five, six times already before that preliminary hearing. Other times we might get a uh, case file and we might get it the day before a preliminary hearing. And so the attorney is seeing them the day before, not because the attorney's not seeing them promptly enough, but because we got the file, you know, the request came into our office and the next day the, the hearing is scheduled. So, um, so yeah, I, that, that's a case by case basis. So how about the next question? Okay, and I just wanted to clarify that was for both a preliminary hearing and a preliminary arraignment. Correct. Okay, I do apologize, Robert, for mixing up the question. I hope that does answer it for you. Um, the next question that we have that came in is from Jeffrey McConnell. Um, he is asking more of a situational question, and that is if a housing provider that is getting funding partly or wholly you know what, I'm, I'm sorry, I want to clarify one thing that I said before. With respect to when a preliminary arraignment, oftentimes we are not there because we don't have the case yet, just so that's clear. In other words, a person gets arrested, they have their arraignment right away, and we're, we don't have the case yet. So sometimes we will have the case if it's someone that has been our client and they are getting additional charges, but if they're not our client yet, we often don't get them until after the preliminary arraignment just to make that clear. So, um, I'm sorry. So, uh, could you repeat that question, the other question for me? Okay. Um, again, the, no worries. The question's from Jeffrey McConnell and it's a situational question. If a housing provider that is getting funding partly or wholly through public funds, um, HUD, is infringing on a citizen's rights, then sues the citizen, but the housing provider loses that case, would the county try to get money back for the use of taxpayer money used in defending that citizen? Um, that That is not really a question that is something that I can answer with respect to the history of the public defender's office. Okay, moving forward. The next question that we have is from Dan Falco. Um, he would like to know, how does, it, how does a defendant get all of the financial data you need if he or she is in jail? They don't need to provide financial data if they're in jail. And the last one that we have that came in, or the, one, the next one up, is from Maureen Simonetta. How often do cases get referred to the public defender's office go to trial as compared to plea deals? Um, I'm not sure that I, how often do cases refer to the public defenders? You mean, how often do our cases go to trial? I mean, that's certainly a case by case basis. It depends on um, what the client, if the client wishes to go to trial, we go to trial. Um, if the client wishes to enter a plea deal, that's what we do. Um, there are there are often times that we think, I mean, it, it, that's a case by case basis, so. Um, okay. All right. And then also I'd like to remind the audience that if you do have a follow-up question or if you want to ask something else that may not have been clear, at the end of the session, once we finish the presentation, um, you have the opportunity to raise your hand or press star nine to speak and better address your question if it's not all covered in the written format. Um, and then just one more question Maureen has is that 
percentage wise or is that pertaining to something else? Um, percentage wise. That may be hard to answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So let me just put this here. Did you want to finish up? Look, looks like questions are cheap, keep coming in at this point. Did you want to wrap up the presentation so we can go back to these? Yeah, you know what? I'm, I'll, I'll do that um, because I will do that because we're going to get into the adult system and the juvenile system. And then we'll, you know, we'll, um, I'll, I'll, because I can see the next question so that this might be, it might be good for us to go through the system and then I can answer the next question. Okay. Okay. And it looks like I'm still sharing the screen. So am I on the right slide then for you, Kim? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So the adult um, criminal justice system, this just gives you a little bit of an overview of the system um, in case, um, you know, you, you're not familiar with it. So again, police investigation. So the police conduct an investigation and um, a person's ar arrested. Um, and you can have a preliminary arraignment. Now, there is also another way for a person to be charged. If they're charged with a misdemeanor, um, they can be sent a summons. And that would involve um, just kind of receiving the documents in the mail. Um, and there's also something that we call a book and release. So a person's arrested, but they don't have their preliminary arraignment. They're, 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 they're charged, they're booked, and then they are released. Um, but this kind of flow chart is just what happens when there's actually an arrest and then there is a preliminary arraignment. So there is a preliminary arraignment and the magisterial uh, district justice, and it's in green there because that's kind of highlighting where the magisterial district justice is, um, <clears throat> where they get involved. Um, and um, so, oops, I'm sorry, I'm clicking on something here. Uh, so th that's what the green is. So they do the preliminary arraignments. Um, that's where they will set bail. Um, then there is a preliminary hearing. Now, this chart says dismiss slash not guilty. Okay, you're never found not guilty at a preliminary hearing. But, um, you know, there are certain um, summary offenses that can happen where you have a summary trial before a magisterial district judge where you can be found not guilty. So, um, again, at the preliminary hearing, it could be dismissed. Um, or if it's a summary trial, you could be found not guilty. Or if it's a summary trial, you could be found guilty. And those are the two um, little forks that are coming off on the right. Um, but if you have the preliminary hearing and the case is not dismissed, and it is a preliminary hearing, the case will be bound over um, to the Court of Common Pleas. If you get to your preliminary hearing and for whatever reason you don't have a hearing, you maybe waive the hearing into the Court of Common Pleas because they're gonna be dropping some charges um, or because you're gonna be placed in some kind of diversionary program or for some other reason, again, the case will then go to the Common Pleas. So I don't know if you can scroll down a little bit, Laura, or maybe make it a little bit smaller. I'm, I can't see the bottom of this. There you go. Perfect, thank you. Um, so the Court of Common Pleas, at that point, then you have what's called your formal arraignment. Um, and the formal arraignment is um, where the charges are formally filed in the Court of Common Pleas by the district attorney's office. Um, at the arraignment, the judge will advise you of any of your uh, pretrial rights, and that's where time deadlines start running. Um, after your preliminary arraignment, you can have a trial by a judge or you can enter a guilty plea. You can also, after a uh, arraignment, and this is not, I did not make this chart. This is a chart I got from somewhere else. But what, if I were making the chart, I would also kind of put sort of not, it's not on the same level as a trial or a guilty plea, maybe, you know, a little bit between the arraignment and that. You can file pretrial motions. 
you can file a whole lot of pretrial motions, motions for discovery, motions um, to dismiss, um, motions to suppress, uh, you know, a whole bunch of different um, pretrial motions that can be filed. And the judge can hear that. And sometimes those pretrial motions, if it's a motion for what we call a habeas corpus and um, to release the person, right? To dismiss the charge. If that gets granted, the charge will get dismissed. And then you don't go to trial by jury. You don't go to guilty plea, the charge is dismissed. Um, but if, um, if that does not happen, then you will either have a trial by a judge or a jury um, or a guilty plea. And if you have a trial by judge or jury, of course, you're either found, if you're found not guilty, that ends it. If you're found guilty, you go to sentencing, or if you plead guilty, you go to sentencing. And then there can, of course, be probation and incarceration. So that's just like a little, a very brief overview of the criminal process for those people that are, that are not familiar with the criminal process. Um, the juvenile process, next slide, please, is a little bit different. Okay, so in the, um, the juvenile um, justice flowchart, so um, a crime is committed and there can be, or, or there, a crime is alleged to have been committed. You know, again, this is the problem when, <laughs> when you use uh, charts from other, uh, you know, from other books and articles and things like that, because, um, you know, the verbiage isn't always what I would like. But anyway, there's, there is a, a crime alleged to have been committed. And either the, the youth can go into a diversionary program which sort of diverts them out of the juvenile justice system. That's one option. Or um, uh, the allegation paperwork is filed by the police. Um, when that happens, if the allegation paperwork is fired by the, filed by the police, they can, and there's also diversions that can happen at, at that point as well, but, um, but they can either be released to their parent or they could go into secure detention. Um, we um, try very hard, our, our numbers um, in security detention are um, really, they, they have re been reduced greatly. Um, that is something, we have a team of juvenile attorneys that I should also tell you, um, that that is their whole job. Um, they represent juveniles and they are very skilled and very knowledgeable and they too go to special training on a yearly basis, but, and actually more than just yearly, um, several times a year and go to certain trainings that, that um, teach particular aspects of juvenile defense. <clears throat> but um, so then there is an intake conference which happens with a probation officer. So, and again, these, these words are not really the words that, that we use. Um, so we have an intake conference, but then we don't, you don't have a trial. It's not called a trial. It's called a, a, an adjudication hearing. So you would either have an adjudication hearing and the case could be dismissed or you could be adjudicated delinquent. Um, the court makes finding of facts. Um, again, at the, as you can see at, at the intake conference, you could also be diverted. Remember I told you, you could be diverted later in the process as well. So you could be diverted there. Um, you can have a consent decree after that intake conference as well, which is sort of like, kind of like the equivalent of an adult ARD, sort of like a special kind of probation. Um, and um, so the court makes findings of fact um, and can make an, a determination of adjudication. So they can dismiss it altogether or they would make findings of fact and either adjudicate them delinquent or, or adjudicate them or um, not adjudicate them to delinquent, okay? So either they get adjudicated or not adjudicated, okay? Adjudicated is equivalent in adult terms to being found guilty. I mean, ad yeah, adjudicated in adult terms is the equivalent of being found guilty. Not adjudicated is equivalent in adult terms to being found not guilty. But we don't use those terms because this is not, the juvenile system is not the same as the adult system. And so we don't use terms like guilt or innocence, um, pleading guilty, um, sentenced. We don't use those terms. It is a, um, a system which focuses 
um, primarily on the rehabilitation of the juvenile. Um, and that is the primary focus of the juvenile system. Um, and so um, the, if, if the juvenile is adjudicated delinquent, then there is what's called a disposition hearing. Um, they can either be placed on probation or they can get placed in a facility. Normally, um, placements in facilities are, are for um, you know, you know, children that maybe have additional issues or needs that cannot be addressed outside um, on probation. Um, okay, and I think I have one more slide and then I'll take questions. So these are frequent questions. <laughs> uh, like I told you in the beginning, are public defenders real lawyers? Yes, of course they are. Licensed attorneys practice only criminal law. And I told you all about that. Um, do I have to pay for representation? The answer is no. Um, I know we had a, I had a question when I did this before. Somebody had an experience in another state where they had a sliding scale. Um, we don't have that. It, it is, if you are indigent, you will you know, be provided a public defender and it doesn't just mean, by the way, it's not just that you get a public defender. You have all of our services, as well as we have contracts with a wide variety of experts to aid us. We, um, although we do have client advocates and we have investigators, um, as I told you, we will hire experts who deal with, you know, certain areas of the case. For example, a cell phone expert we might hire. We might hire a forensic pathologist, somebody to look at an autopsy and to review that and to advise us. Um, we will often hire, um, especially if it's, a, if it's a capital case, we will hire a mitigation specialist, somebody whose job it is just to deal with that, that type of defense. So when you get us, you get all of those services as well. Um, we do have in our office, we have a bilingual support staff member and we have a, an attorney who's really, she's more than, she's, she speaks, I think she speaks four languages fluently. So um, we do have that, but, but in addition, if um, you know, we need a, an interpreter, we certainly will have that um, available as well. Um, I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit in the beginning about it and I kind of forgot about it. We are having a pure online application, which it's in the process of being um, um, developed right now with our IT department. So it will be just like anything else. Like if you go on to, you know, I don't know, you want to fill out an application for a credit card or for anything else that you would do online, you would just, it's not a fillable form. It's just, there are fields like anything else online. And you would, you could type it all in, um, you know, and um, there you can upload your documents. You can do it from your phone. It's gonna be mobile friendly. Again, my goal is to try to get people represented as early as possible and without a lot of hassle. You know, if somebody is charged with a crime, they have a lot going on in their life and they don't need obstacles to getting representation. They need, they need um, it to be, um, as I think as painless and seamless as possible. And so that's what I'm trying to do with that, um, with that online process. And the last frequent question, and then I'll take your questions. What, what happens if I'm denied? So maybe you're denied because um, you make too much money. Maybe you're denied because it's a traffic offense and we don't represent people in traffic offenses, unless of course it's an offense that has mandatory jail time. What happens? Well, you can call the Bar Association Lawyer Referral Service, and I, I provided the number. Um, if you're denied, but your financial situation has changed, we recommend that you, I said, come back to the office to reapply. Uh, don't come back. You, you call us, you say, my situation has changed. We'll have you fill out a new application, or sometimes not even fill out a new application. Just provide new financials. We have people who, especially during the pandemic, um, were working applied um, and were above our, our uh, financial criteria um, and um, then lost their jobs. And they contacted us and said, I've lost my job. They sent in a, you know, a copy of their letter of termination. 
and they were then approved for representation. So um, we, we try to work with people as best as we can to make sure that people are represented. Um, okay, those are all the slides. So I guess we can take the next questions. Um, now, if I if I click on if I, if I click on if you click Q and A at the bottom of the yeah. screen, you should be able to see the questions. Okay. So I guess the question that we were on um, when we switched back to the slides was from Jan, and it says, "You said you work with all juveniles. I keep hearing the phrase school to prison pipeline. I don't really understand what it entails or implies. Does the public defender's office have a program in place to interrupt this in some way? Absolutely." So, um, so that is one of the things that our client advocates work with, and that is one of the reasons why, and I really believe this, um, I am proud of the fact that we have attorneys who, um, I, am, I am proud that we have attorneys who, I, I don't want to use the term specialize, and that's why I'm sort of hesitating, but who concentrate, that's the word I want to use, who concentrate on juvenile defense. You know, um, juveniles deserve to have that. And so that to me is so important to have um, lawyers out there, defenders out there who are dedicated and are, and again, you know, I, I am very proud of, of our staff and I am very proud of our lawyers. So um, our attorneys work um, very you know, very closely with other partners and again with our client advocates and with the families to ensure that um, our clients um, that we represent, the juvenile clients that we represent, do not, you know, we do not want them to wind up in prison, right? That's our whole goal. And that's what when we talk about, you know, the goal of the system is really to um, rehabilitate right, and to get into place some services um, for these individuals uh, that, um, you know, mentoring programs, and there's just a whole host of things, and so we work with that. That's another thing that we do, and I'm going to say in, in response sort of to this question, we partner with so many different community organizations, and I'm proud of that as well. Um, we, par we partner with uh, Zero Youth Violence, Promised Neighborhoods, um, Reciprocity, um, other community organ organizations that we work with um, and um, we will contact them and say, we want, you know, we want to get this child into this, into zero, you know, we, we, we call Paz Simpson and say, hey, we, we want this um, juvenile in this uh, particular program because we want to make sure that this kid does not wind up getting into the adult system. So, yeah, so so we partner with a lot of people. And like I said, I think part of the partnering um, is that we have a, attorneys and advocates who concentrate on you know, juveniles. Okay, next question. Um, do you want me to read it, Laura, or, sh or should I? Or should I? Um, I can read it for you if you like. Um, I was just afraid that if I write it again, I was gonna maybe misinterpret okay. something. So, um, okay, so it says, um, okay. Um, From Maureen Simonetta, looks like the next one. Okay. Um, how many cases of public defender's office end up as plea deals? I think that was the same question from before. Yeah, I can, yeah, I think percentage wise, you said that that's- Oh, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't have, I don't have the, um, you know, just, I was just, I, I, I don't have the percentages with me. Next one is not a question, but Suzanne says, I appreciate all you do for your clients and the holistic approach that would seem to require more staff. And then the next one, again, is from Susan. Um, I can read it for you if you like, or if you wanted to read it. I, I, I've read it. Um, I, you know, those are like budget questions that I don't think are really for this um, presentation. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. Um, and it's again from Maureen Simonetta. What is the percentage of cases that are presented um, kind of similar than to the previous question? Right. Yeah, I... I 
I don't have the I don't have percentages with me. Okay. So moving on from the Q and A submission box, um, we are now at the point in the presentation where um, the audience can participate with their audio. If you would like to ask a question for Kim and you're using the computer or mobile app on your phone, please use the raise your hand um, feature to be allowed to speak. If you're joining us today by telephone, please press star nine. So I'm gonna give a moment to see if anyone is open to raising their hand and speaking. And I do also want to iterate, I can't remember if I mentioned it already, but you all will be receiving a copy of this presentation and an email follow up tomorrow. So if you were taking notes and you missed something, um, fret not, you will get it um, sent to you. Okay, it looks like we have a question from Susan. And I apologize, Susan, if I mispronounce your last name, Geronimo. Um, you're going to be given the floor to ask a question. And you may unmute your mic. Okay, thanks. I really appreciate this um, this event. Um, I asked the budget, budget question because I've only heard that public defenders are very overworked and, and that the job is extremely stressful. And I'm sure that this affects what kind of service can be provided. So it, um, um, I'm kind of asking, do you think that you have all the resources that you need? And um, how many advocates are there in Lehigh County to do all that extra work that needs to be done? Well, so let me, let me answer the question in this way. So as I said, um, client advocates are something that are not, not every office. Um, we're fortunate in Lehigh County that we have two. Um, and I'm not saying that, um, you know, you know, the, the point is that we are working towards a, um, a holistic approach, as, as I think you had put in your written question about that, and that we're working towards that. Um, and when I say working towards that, meaning that we are, um, I'm, we have our client advocates, we're working with them, we're seeing how we're, you know, um, how they participate, what we need more of. Um, what works, what doesn't work, what, you know, how things should work better. Um, and so I'm very fortunate that I, that I have two of them. Um, like I said, many, many public defenders offices have zero. Um, many public defenders offices, um, I am fortunate that I have a budget uh, that I get to hire. I have budget with line items to hire experts. Um, many counties, and I know this because I was I was the president of the statewide public defenders association for, for three years, actually, I was supposed to be done sooner, but then COVID happened and we couldn't have our meeting to elect people. So I stayed on even longer and I actually started sooner because someone left. So the point is I was there for like three years um, as president, as president um, and I'm still very involved in it. But, um, but, um, so I'm hearing a lot of, Okay, maybe it's better now. Okay, um, I was I was hearing some feedback. Um, so, um, but anyway, uh, some public defenders offices don't even have that. They have to go to the court and say to the court, "I want to hire this expert. Can you appoint this expert for me? Can I have money for this expert?" Fortunately, we don't have to do that because we have a budget, and I have line items, and in those line items is where I can get all of those experts and those witnesses and my psychological evaluations and my um, mitigation and you know whatever I, I might need. Um, and so we, we also, I, I will tell you recently in our budget um, hired um, another attorney. We, um, in the past several budget cycles, I've hired, um, I, I had a new position added of a new full-time attorney to handle the DUIs. Um, we have a, an additional part-time attorney that we hired. Um, and so, um, so when, you know, as we work through things and as we change things, when there is something that we believe is needed to assist us in assisting our clients, we certainly go forward to the commissioners um, and to the administration and we, and we ask for those items. And um, they have been, you know, they, I, you know, they have been accommodating 
to me when I have expressed that we have needed these things. So, um, you know, we should all be proud of that, that, um, that when I've needed things, they have, you know, honored those requests and, um, and we have been able to provide those services. So um, next question, Laura. I don't know is there, if there's one. You're, you're muted, Laura, so I don't know if you're talking to me. I, I'm so, I, I was speaking and I didn't see my mic was on, so sorry. That's okay. um, so the next question that we have is from um, Maureen Simonetta. Maureen, I am going to give you um, the ability to speak and unmute your mic. And you may now ask your question. Okay. I actually have like three, but they're short. Could I ask all three? <laughs> Or no. Um. Sure. No. No worries. So I wanted to know how many public defenders there were, as compared to ADAs. Um. I. I. Okay. So, I mean, I can tell you what I. I'm a, I'll tell you what I have in my office. I know Jim. I, I believe that the DA is on the the list to give his overview. Um. At another time. So I'll talk about my office. So I have uh, 21 attorneys. Okay. All right. And I wanted to know who pays for the uh, public defenders? Like, uh, suppose a person gets uh, supplied a public defender, who pays for that? The, I mean, they're, they're paid, they're funded by the, by Lehigh County. Okay. And what is considered indigent? So, um, yeah, so what we do is um, I will take a, I, I use 175% of the poverty level. And um, I also take into consideration dependents um, and other individuals who are, um, you know, who this person supports. Because you gave that example that like you had someone and they they were denied representation, but then they lost their job and then they were eligible. And I'm just wondering, like what what is the financial? Is could you give me a financial number? Well, no, because we take we take the poverty level. Um, so every year the poverty level by the federal government gets changed. Mm -hmm. uh, we multiply it by some. Some counties, there's no, there's no set standard. Some do um, 100%, some do 150%, some do, you know, I, I did 175% because I wanted to, you know, make, you know, more people, um, you know, be provided with services. Um, and so, but then there's other criteria. So there's, there's criteria um, such as, you know, are they representing, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, not representing, I apologize. Are they, you know, do they have children? Do they have other dependents that they are financially responsible for? So all of those things go into consideration when determining whether or not a person is indigent. You know, so a, a person could be, look, you could look at it and go, oh, look, they, they make good money, but then you find out that they've got, you know, let's say they have six small children, you know, that they're responsible for. Well, now they're really not. Um, their, their money isn't that okay um, at this at that point. So all of those factors don't go into the determination. Okay. Um, Laura, do we have another question? Okay. Yes, it looks like we have another question um, from Dan Falco. Yes. I thought you have him, I see Henry Moore up. I don't know. Um, Dan came on top first, so okay. we'll give Dan a few. Um, let me just see. All right, Dan, you are granted the floor to ask your question and you may unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Dan. Hi. <laughs> um, quick no, no, Dan. So <laughs> How are you? I'm good. So, so Pennsylvania, I think is the only state or one of the only states where this, the, the state does not provide funding for the County public defenders correct Absolutely. leaves it correct. to the county to get that money, and I'm wondering just your take is 
has that been a is that a hindrance to you? You know, compared to other states, is the funding on par? Do, do you have some do you have some benefits because it's done locally, or is it is it a is it a better thing or a worse thing in your? Well, I, I guess here's here's the here's the truthful answer. It depends on where you are, right? It depends on where you are. So um, I I would I would say that there are some counties that probably um, are not you know, funded as well. There are other counties that are funded very well, you know, so it depends on, you know, when you're talking about county versus state, um, you know, that's the answer. It, it depends on where you are and how well your county is funding you um, because, you know, we have 67 different counties, 67 different public, there's also not, there's no state, um, there are no state, um, I don't want to use the term guidelines, but there's 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 not a, a standard that says each public defender's office has to get, get there must get that. Um, it's it's really kind of it's county by county. So um, so it depends on on that. Now I've I've talked to counterparts in other states. I actually interestingly, um, and I feel like I should need to check up on them. I was on a Zoom conference with public defenders from Dallas County, Texas, like a couple weeks ago. And now with you know, everything going on there, I, I truly need to, you know, reach out and check in on them. But, um, you know, we were talking about them and their, their um, I mean, we didn't talk numbers, so I don't know what their numbers are, but we talked about, you know, services and what we do and what we provide. And it's, even though they're much larger than Lehigh County is, um, it, it was very, similar to what we do so um yeah so so that's the you know that's the short answer um do we have henry next i saw yep and then we have henry and it looks like susan again i believe susan was next okay and correct me if i'm wrong i'm sorry if i'm skipping over anyone um Okay. Okay, Susan, you have the floor again. Yes, thank you. I, um, I have a couple of things. One, did I hear this right, that if a juvenile is caught with a DUI, it's mandatory jail time? No. No. That's adults, not juveniles. Oh, if an adult is caught with a DUI, that's mandatory jail time? Um, it depends. It depends. Okay. On the, it depends on the level of the offense. And it depends on whether or not ARD is, an, is something that's that they're eligible for. Okay. And you said that there were other groups available to support people, not just the public defenders groups. And I was wondering what some of those groups were. You mean when I said we partner with other individuals? Yeah. No, groups. Other groups that are... Right. With other organizations? Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, like I said, I mean, there's a whole host. Um, Conference of Churches um, is, is one. Um, you know, uh, as I said, uh, Zero Youth Violence. Um, oh, okay. Neighborhoods, you know, those kinds of organizations. Yeah. Okay. And um, have you heard of the CAHOOTS program that they use in Oregon, which is a group? This doesn't, it's not directly connected to you, but pr probably indirectly. Um, it's a group that uh, takes 911 calls and they deal with calls that are about mental illness and addiction, things like that. I, I didn't know. I mean, I know exactly what you're talking about. I didn't realize it was called that name, but yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, do you think that that would help the, your public defenders work if a lot of that stuff was dealt with in a different way? Well, I mean, so that's sort of what our client advocates are for. Um, in, in our office, you know, I can't speak for any other offices or any other organizations, um, you know, but in, for us, that's one of the, that's why I want to get our client advocates, like, you know, be one of the first points of contact, right? Because, you know, they have, they have experiences and um, knowledge, um, you know, that, that the lawyers, because we're lawyers and we're not, you know, social workers and we don't have that training, you um, um, we, we try, you know, we try, but we, but we don't have that specialized training. That's why we need them. And that's why we have them. And they're so, they're so helpful to us. So they'll, they will go in, um, 
and they will interview, you know, our clients and, um, you know, oftentimes will recommend certain things. Um, and, and sometimes they're recommending something that, that might be out of there. Like they might say, gee, you know, th this person might need a competency evaluation. Well, they can't do the competency evaluation, but then we, you know, we hire one of our expert witnesses to come in and, and, you know, one of our psychologists will come in and, um, you know, I don't even want to say expert witness because I mean, because they're 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 being hired as a psychologist, not as a witness. You know, right? It's so not a hire that that psychologist to come in and to to interview that person and to you know do an assessment. So um, so yeah, I think that that there is, and I think that there's a greater understanding. I mean, if, I feel like we're getting a little. I mean, and I I totally appreciate the question. Um, I don't want to get too far off topic though, but. I, I do think that there is, um, thankfully now, much better appreciation from, you know, um, other stakeholders as to, you know, the effects of, of mental illness in, in the criminal justice system and that, you know, really uh, the criminal justice system is not the place for people who have mental illness, right? So, um, so um, yeah, but that, but that's, that's what our client advocates do for us. So, um, as I said, I'm very thankful that, that we have them. And one last thing, would you like to have a bigger budget? You know what? <laughs> I don't want to, we're getting like, we're getting way off topic and I don't want to, I don't want to get off, off of our topic and I'm not dodging the question because, you know, I mean, that's a whole budget conversation. Um, you know, I, I, you know, we, we can talk about all of that when, when it's budget time, but, um, but for now, you know, um, as I said, I am, I am very, excited about all of the new things that we're doing and, um, you know, all of the new programming that we're doing. And, um, and I will say this too, COVID has been challenging. And I, I, we had a staff meeting last week, totally proud of my staff because we've really, we really, um, I, I think we've done as best as we can do, you know, in a really difficult, difficult circumstance. So um, yeah. So um, is there another question, Laura, or was that? Yes, we have a couple more. Um, the next one is another speaker. We have three more. Henry, I am going to give you the ability to speak and unmute your mic, and you are good to ask your question. Okay, thank you. I have uh, appreciate what I've heard about the using the holistic approach, and I know I don't believe you have a, a program that's titled "Affecting Systemic Racism," but can you talk a little bit about how you think uh, the work of your office uh, combats systemic racism? So, um, well, Henry, you and I have um, we see each other um, at uh, CJAB meetings, right? And um, yes, at, at some other other things, and so I've always enjoyed um, working with you. Um, as well. So I can, I can, when people ask about community partners, <laughs> here's one of our community partners right, right here on this, on this Zoom. Um, yeah, so um, that is a, uh, such a good question. And I think that that is something that um, um, both are, um, you know, are not, not only our social workers, but also our attorneys, I believe, um, you know, that is an area that we all need to really delve into and to um, try to understand that the correlation between, you know, systemic racism and, and you know, racism um, and as it relates to um, involvement in the criminal justice system. And, um, and so that is something again, and, and it, you know, I mean, Henry, you and I can talk offline about this you know, probably for, for five hours, you know, maybe more um, um, about, about this. Um, but yeah, it absolutely is an issue. And I, and I think that what, what our social, what our, you know, client advocates try to do, and I, and I never, I, you know, not that there's anything wrong. I love social workers. Social workers are great. I, I, but, but the client advocate is really the essence of who they are, you know, in relationship to our clients, right? They're their advocate. They're their, the attorneys are their advocate. We're their advocates in terms of legal issues and all of that. But these advocate as they navigate through all of those things. So um, so with respect to our, our clients, I think what our social workers do is, you know, we try to send them to, again, as, as much training 
um, as possible so that they, um, first of all, have whatever tools that they need, right? So that they have the knowledge and the tools that, that they can utilize. But, um, but also, um, but, but also, and I'm sorry, I'm hesitating because I, I, every once in a while I, I get some feedback and it's a little distracting, but now I don't, I don't hear it again. Um, but anyway, um, but I think that, you know, I think that everybody there, again, there has to be not just a recognition from the, the public defender that that's an issue. Obviously, we know that. But it is getting that across to all of the stakeholders in the criminal justice system and then taking steps to to intervene, especially I mean, at every level, but especially again at the juvenile level. Right. Um, to prevent the juveniles from even getting in um, to the to the system in the first place. So there has to be, um, you know, a recognition and um, an advocacy on our part to, you know, to the the courts and other players that that there that this, although, you know, and I, I think people will hear this, although perhaps, um, you know, one person is saying, I have not done these, these things to this individual or this group of people, I have been fair. That's not really what the issue is. The issue is how has everything, right, impacted and, and molded and directed people in their the way that they've reacted with this individual, the way that they've responded to this individual, even the services that this individual has gotten. So all of those things are things that, that are really important. So I don't know that I really totally answered your question, but um, but I would love to, to talk to you more about it like when we have a lot of time, maybe maybe after a, um, maybe after, maybe once we're back in person at CJAB, we can go have a cup of coffee and talk more about it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Laura, I think you're muted again. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Second time. Because okay. I'm worried that the feedback you're getting is the rickety chair that I'm sitting on. Oh, so. every, every once in a while, I, it's like I'm hearing myself. Everything I say is repeated back to me. Oh, uh, OK. Yeah. I'm worried that I'm the one causing the feedback problem, so I always go on mute. Um, so we have a few more questions that filtered in. Sure. Um, the next one is from looks like we have the next one from Robert Walden um, and he is asking does your office work with pretrial services for some clients and if so how does that work oh oh I'm sorry I was waiting to hear okay um oh yeah absolutely we work with pretrial services all the time um, um and how does it work um I'm not sure exactly what you mean by how does it work but um but uh, you know, I mean, like, if you're asking me, I, I guess I'm sorry. I, I don't know what you mean by how does it work. I mean, like, our clients are supervised by pretrial services. Sometimes we contact them if there's an individual in jail that we don't think should be there, and we're like, you know, hey, do you have any information as to why this person's in jail? Um, so if, if you mean in that way, yes, that's we, we work with them in that way. Um, but there are times that we file bail motions and they don't necessarily agree with what we're doing. Um, what does the interaction at pretrial look like? I um, mean, it looks like Robert, he is raising his hand. Maybe he can better clarify yeah, what he means. Yeah, but yeah. I'm not. I would, yeah, that, Robert, you floor to speak and you are muted and you can ask your question. Yeah, I, I just wondered, you know, what, what, how do you work with pretrial services? Is I, uh, since it, um, I mean, obviously the clients that are coming in, uh, you have some responsibilities, and pretrial services has some responsibilities, and uh, you know, if you're providing social services or you're diverting folks, uh, uh, evidently you would have some conversation back and forth. But I'm, I'm curious, you know, how that works or. Uh, I mean, well, it, it's so, so it's often just, it's often like what I described. It's, it's that, you know, we will, 
contact them if a person's in jail and we'll say, hey, this individual's in jail. Did you, did you interview them? What's your recommendation? And if they say, you know, well, um, like for example, here's a perfect example. We had an individual and I think we actually, it was in the, the newspaper article about our client advocate. Um, but we had an individual who really was, um, uh, she was incarcerated. She was incarcerated over a weekend. Um, and so Monday morning, we became aware of this. It was a, it, it, it actually was a more, it was a felony um, offense. It was a felony too. So it was a more serious offense. But she was a person that we did not believe belonged. Um, you know, we did not believe she was a risk of flight. We did not believe she was a danger to self or others. And so therefore, we believe she should be out of jail. Um, um, and so we contacted pretrial and they said, yeah, we agree with you, but you know, she doesn't have an address. So we were like, okay, well, our, our client advocate, long story short, she did have an address and we got the address and we gave the address to them and it all worked out in a matter of like an hour. So, you know, there was that back and forth and that kind of give and take. Um, and um so so sometimes it's that you know it's it's working like that you know but you know i, I don't know i mean if working yes we work with them in the same system um and we will talk with them about their bail recommendations but there's often times where we don't agree you know where they say well we think this guy's a, a flight risk so we're recommending five thousand straight and we say well we're gonna file a bail motion you know, so then we're we're on opposite uh, sides of that of that issue. So, um, so um, I, I that's the best answer I can give. Um, no, thank you. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, I think there's Jan um, uh, Sudermeister. Is that? I'm sorry, yeah. and I'm sorry, I'm I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, um Jan is asking um basically asking how can a citizen um advocate for what the public defender's office is doing and how could someone help out the office if they wish oh wow um well um so i don't want to i don't want to say things before they happen but um there are some community outreaches that we're considering but we you know Everything is getting the kibosh because of COVID. And so that's why I don't wanna say certain things, but we, there are some other things that we're kind of looking at. And so when those things, if those things are going to happen, and I'm not gonna say more, not to keep you all in suspense or anything, but I, I don't wanna promise things that just can't happen because of the circumstance of you know, the pandemic and everything. But, um, but there are certain areas that we'd like to participate um, and, and, you know, with the community. And so maybe some of those events we might, um, you know, if, if we have those events, if we're able to have those events, that, that might be that. And certainly, you know, if, if, um, you know, I mean, that, that's the, the best way, you know, to, you know, to volunteer, um, you know, if, if, again, if we have those events, but also let me, let me tell you this. And, and this is even, I think, even better, it's not, you're not even directly working with us, but volunteer with any of the community partners that we work with, you know, that's what we need. We need more volunteers with our community partners, more people out there, right? So that if we do refer somebody to, you know, any one of our community partners, there's enough people there to help. So that's even, even more so than than what you know than than my you know thoughts and ideas for the future there's things that you can do right now that would help and you know what when you help our clients that's helping us because that's our whole goal is okay and it looks like the next question we have is from jeffrey mcconnell he would like the floor to speak so jeffrey you are going to be allowed to speak and you are unmuted hi right, can you hear me yes hi Hi. Um, uh, you kind of touched on it when uh, you spoke about uh, programs and whatnot, and this is more geared towards, you know, kids, because uh, I'm, I'm a father, I have three boys, but I also understand that 
there is a kind of a system, um, you know, a perpetual system pushing uh, kids into the prison system. Um, and you're talking about outreach. And I was wondering if you do, if your office does have any outreach with uh, the youth in terms of schools and stuff like that. Um, so I might ask you to clarify what you mean by like with the schools, you mean like, do we send people into the schools or what? I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. Um, well, I, I guess a, a good example, because uh, I'm a veteran and some of the stuff that we would do is go to the school and talk about some of the programs, almost like a D.A.R.E. program. Yes. OK. Um, okay. Yes, we do. So anyway, and thank you for your service, by the way. Um, but I, I want to say that um, that we we do. So and this is how we do it. Um, we do it through our bar association um, has like law day um, every year. And um, we always send members of our office again, COVID. So, you know, obviously that hasn't happened. Um, and I don't know that it's going to happen again this year because, you know, again, um, but we will send people out um, to the schools and to talk about, um, I mean, they're really supposed to talk about like being a, being a public defender, being a lawyer, um, different things like that. Um, but we do that absolutely. And we encourage, um, we encourage that. We also, and again, you know, I, I keep saying COVID, but it, it I, I, th I think to myself, wow, it's been so long since this has happened. Sometimes certain schools will come to the courthouse. And so we always participate in that. Um, when the schools will come, like just to like watch a trial or to observe, we participate, we take questions, we talk about that. We also will participate in um, uh, with with any school that 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 comes to the um, the bar association does it as well as um, there's a particular um, individual in the courthouse that also organizes it. But um, there's mock trials and different schools throughout the whole county will participate and we will volunteer and participate in that. So we do community outreach in in those in those ways, um, absolutely. But um, you know, but I think that again, there are some other other things that I'm that I'm thinking of as well. Like I said, um, that I'm thinking of it for the future. That I would really um, that I'm really excited and and hoping. Um, I've been talking to my client advocates, um, both for adults and for and for juveniles too. So some additional things that are kind of just be us. Yeah. Now th those are all great things. Um, but do you guys also mention that if you do get into a jam, oh. this is a possibility. Uh, we do have our offices available and these are the steps to go through. Yeah, and actually I'm gonna tell you something else that I didn't tell anybody and I'll tell you this. This is also a program that I started. Um, we have, um, so oftentimes when we would talk to a client, um, after a client was charged, we would talk to a client, a client would express frustration. And I'm not gonna get into all the details of um, the context of it all, but that, you know, that they, there wasn't a lawyer with them. You know, they couldn't pay for a lawyer and they were being questioned and there was no lawyer with them and they weren't charged at the time. So they didn't have a lawyer because they, they didn't have a public defender because they weren't charged yet, right? So I thought, well, um, I want to make sure that if a person is being interrogated and they need a lawyer, that they have a lawyer. And so I, um, again, you know, um, um, got the, you know, the funds I, um, and I was able to get, and this sounds like a small thing, but we got on-call phones. And so you think, what on-call phones? So we have cell phones, particular numbers, and we sent it out to every police department in Lehigh County. We sent it to every, um, you know, to the district attorney's office. Um, and we periodically send them reminders and we have on-call phones. And there are two attorneys on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, so that if there ever is a situation where a person is, you know, with the police, now it's not a, it's not a like, you know, hey, I have a quick question. I mean, I'd say they're, they're in, in with the police 
the, and they say, I want a public defender, you know, they're, the police have our number that if that person says, I don't have a lawyer, but I want a public defender, they have the numbers that, that are to be called so that the individuals, um, you know, can, can talk to us and we can advise them what to do. Um, so yes. So, and I, I, I've told that and we've had it. I mean, I've had individuals come to my window at the public defender's office. They haven't been charged, but you know, they've been, let's say they're being investigated and they know they are because they, or the police want to speak to them or whatever. And I, we will talk, I don't say to them, well, no, you know, you, you can't because, um, especially if it's a juvenile, because, you know, juveniles, the, the law changed back in, um, when that whole um, kids for cash thing happened in Luzerne County. So there is no financial eligibility of parents or anything. We just represent juveniles. That's what the law is now. And <clears throat> so we represent those, um, or, or I should say, that's how the, the, the law changing has now required us to do that. And we're happy to do that and think that's the right thing to do. Um, and so, um, you know, for juvenile comes, we will talk to them. We will, um, you know, talk to them about the situation and um, give them advice as to, as to, you know, what to do. Um, you know, because we know that if they are charged, they're a hundred, you know, they are our client. So, yeah, so we do that. Awesome. Thank you very much for what you do. And sure, sure. thank you. Okay, so it looks like we have one more question. And that is from Robert Walden, and he submitted it into the um, submission box. And he is asking if uh, the public defender's office goes through anti-racism training and their approach on those matters. Okay, so yes, um, absolutely. Every so every year that um, every year that attorneys have um, uh, that you know every year, and, and attorneys have different um, time periods that they have to complete different compliance groups. Sorry getting late, <laughs> a different compliance group. So where we have to complete um, certain hours and certain ethics hours. And um, so while the, um, while that does not require that there be, um, you know, racial sensitivity training or anything like that, there are many opportunities for that within those programmings. Um, within within that type of programming. And so our attorneys do that on a yearly basis. Um, I have also, um, within my office, I will do internal types of programming where I will bring individuals in to speak with our staff um, and to discuss those issues and to discuss them with, with our staff. Um, and not just to discuss them, but to kind of make them aware um, of, of issues. And so, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. We and that and that's something that I think we have to do um, is required of us to do. But thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. Okay, once again, everyone, I would like to remind you if you have a question, um, please raise your hand or press star nine. I don't currently see any questions, so I'm just giving a final call out to see if anyone else would like to ask him a question or any further comments. Okay, one more call for any further questions or comments. Again, if you're on the computer or mobile app, please raise your hand. If you're joining us by telephone, please press star nine. Okay, so I'm not seeing any more questions or any hands being raised. Oh, Laura, I think you're muted again. I am so sorry about that, Kim. I'll let you do your closing remarks and then I'll do the final wrap up if you wanted to say anything else further. So I, I just wanna say that, um, so um, it is my pleasure uh, to do what I do every day that I do it. Um, I hope you can sense that uh, when I talk about it because I do, um, I, love, I love being the public defender um, and I love providing the services to our clients. 
Um, and I'm always looking, as I told you before, for innovative and new ways to deliver better legal representation and better services to our clients. That is my, you know, my number one objective. Um, I also look forward to, um, you know, talking to um, any of you offline. Um, if you have a question or a comment or a concern, please, you know, feel free um, to give me a call. Um, I put the public defender's number in that, um, the PowerPoint presentation. Um, you could also Google it, look it up. Um, so please feel free. Um, some of you I know, um, you know, Bob, I've talked to before, um, you know, Henry, of course. Um, so I, 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 you know, I, I, I know some of you, I, I have, we've had conversations before others we have not, but, you know, certainly, um, you know, if you have a question or a concern or a comment, um, please feel free to, to give me a call and I will try to get you the answer if I don't know it myself. Um, but otherwise, thank you for coming very much and um, I appreciate it. And um, I look forward to doing this again, maybe next year. So <laughs> thank you very much. And again, everyone, I would like to remind you that if you missed any past uh, presentations or you know someone who would have liked to attend it tonight but could not, that we post all these recordings of the broadcast on our Facebook page and on our county website and YouTube channel. So if you would like to have a reference, again, a question you ask, you will have the opportunity to do so. Again, my name is Laura Gramis. I am the Public Information Officer for Lehigh County hosting these seminars. There will not be a seminar next week as that is gonna be um, County Executive Phil Armstrong's State of the County presentation. And then we will resume again in March um, with um, Cedarbrook Director Jason Camello. Again, I'd like to thank you all um, for attending tonight. Um, have a good night, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.